Morning, everybody. Please take your seats. How many of you follow the Oscars? Everybody? For those of you who don't know, Leonardo DiCaprio just won the Oscar. After many, many years and after several nominations, he finally got it. And I wonder, how many of you, when you're alone and no one's watching, how many of you pretend to give a thank you speech for an award? I think those who are giggling, smiling, you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, that's me. But really, I have to admit many times I've done that. I've fantasized what it might be like to finally receive an award for something like that. And wouldn't that sound cool? Because in the end, I think everybody, every single person, has this deep, innate desire to be validated. Wouldn't you agree? Everyone wants to be significant. Everybody wants to feel accepted. Everyone wants to feel uh, applauded or liked. And in the end, when that happens, when validation comes, what's the most common human response? Right. Last week, we talked about this story, or we talked about this man who was very wealthy, and he had a son who was very spoiled, and he, the son dishonored his dad. And so what the father did, just to recap now, so what the father did, because he was so wealthy and he hired all the people in the town, uh, in his factory, he paid the whole town and told everybody, play along, I'm gonna do something to teach my son a lesson, just play along with whatever I do. So one, the, one day when his son came home very, very drunk and couldn't remember what happened or couldn't even be woken up, the father got the son and exchanged his place with a beggar of the same age. So this beggar, he got into his home, dressed up the beggar, gave the beggar nice clothes, and the son, his real son, he dirtied. He put suit on the face, he covered him with clothes that were the beggars. Then he made sure that the son kind of smelled bad and all that, and put his son on the side of the street. And then he told all the townsfolk, guys, when my son starts talking to everybody, pretend that you never knew him to be my biological son. And so what happened, of course, was the son woke up, panicked, went to the father. The father said, I don't know you, you're not my kid. My kid's in the living room playing. And then he, uh, the son went to the neighbors and said, don't you remember me as the son of your boss? And because, of course, the father was the boss and paid everybody, everybody denied it. Everybody said, no, we don't know you. You've always been the beggar on the street. I, we, what are you talking about? And so we ended the story last week with his son going to the father and repenting, saying, Father, I am really sorry for dishonoring you. I, I want to be your son again. But we didn't really uh, give a conclusion. Today we're going to continue the story. What if, instead of the father saying, okay, come back in. What if the father said, no, not yet. The father just let him out on the street again. Because deep down, the father didn't just want the son to have an overnight realization. Rather, he wanted the son to go through a character change. He wanted his son to experience what it's like to be without the love of the dad. And so he had to go through a long period of changing, of repentance, of being humbled, and all that. Today we're going to talk about the history of Israel. Because Israel and us Gentiles are a lot like the real son and the beggar son. Because in the story, what happened was, after a while, the beggar son became arrogant. After a while, the beggar son started to mock the original son. The beggar started saying things like, Oh, you see, I'm so good, I'm so nice, I'm so lovable. That's why this millionaire removed his original son for me. 
Because I am so nice. Isn't that the easiest thing to conclude once you're validated? Now let's take a look at Romans 16, uh, Romans 11, verse 17. If some of the branches, this is now Israel, if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, meaning the Gentiles, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant towards the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root supports you. Then you will say, Branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That's true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. Isn't that usually the case? When we're preferred over something or someone else, the tendency is to feel secure. And then, after security comes, pride. And after pride comes, arrogance. And then what do we do? We start mocking the ones that were not preferred. You see, arrogance is the most natural human fleshly response. Most of the time, for many Christians, they would even go as far as saying this. You know, it was God who saved me, yes. But God should thank me that I chose Him. God should be thankful that I repented. If not for my decision, God wouldn't have me. And then we have all these songs that talk about how lovable man is, that God just could not resist. In fact, I heard a preaching once when the pastor said this, God made you to be so lovable, He couldn't resist saving you. And I was like, wow. We are so lovable that God could not resist me? It sounds like irresistible grace, but flipped on its head. That's not the case. In fact, Paul says, if the branches were broken off so that we might be grafted in, Paul says that's true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. They weren't broken off that Israel was not removed from God's favor because we're better as Gentiles. It's not because we're better. It's because they disobeyed. So we should just feel thankful that we're grafted in, that God said, I'm going to include the Gentiles into my plan. And many times, of course we're talking about Israel and Gentiles, but many times it applies to us today. Just a reminder. In this group, we come from different churches. We come from a variety of different denominations with a variety of different churches. And the fact that you're here, by God's grace, the fact that you're here means you see something here which you prefer, which you think might be helpful or more helpful or more beneficial for you. Maybe you might be growing more. And that's all really by the grace of God. But as a church, if you're here with us, the attitude should not be, it should not be, yeah, we're here because better theology. Or, aha, we have a biblical understanding of ministry. Or, you know, we have a really good culture of discipleship and all that. We shouldn't have a kind of attitude that has pride in it. But in fact, we should be thankful and we should remind ourselves always, it's really by God's grace. And the other thing that happens usually is this. Because you're so validated at one point in your life, or we are validated in a point of our lives, when something bad happens to the place where we come from, normally the heart says this. In Cebuano, it's da ga ba. In English, it's a lot like saying, ha, huh, yeah, they deserve it. Good for them, ha. Huh. Or serves them right, there you go. That's usually the attitude. And that ought not be the case. Imagine if the Gentiles said, Ha! The Israelites were removed from God's favor. Duh! Myra. That shouldn't be the case. Paul says, You stand firm, stand fast through faith. 
And then he warns. He says, Do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will He spare you. It doesn't mean that if, you, if we receive God's favor and God's validation now, it doesn't mean it's going to be there forever. In fact, in the book of Revelation, God warns several churches and God says, if you don't repent, I'm going to remove the lampstand. It's very possible, yes, that you're saved, yes, as a Christian, there's God's justification, God's forgiveness is there, but as a church, it's very, very possible that God says, okay, you know what? This church, they're not doing things the way I want them to anymore. The attitudes have changed and all that. They've lost their first love. I'm going to remove the lampstand. It's very possible. And we know for a fact, by experience, we've seen many churches where they start off good and then it gets destroyed along the way. And I pray and beg God that that, ought not, that would not be the case for us. We should always have a heart that says, Lord, it's by your grace, love. Everything is by your grace. It's not because we're so good, we're so theological, we work hard, we study hard, we, we prepare well, and all. it's got nothing to do with that. Even the grace to prepare comes from God. Even the grace to understand all those theological books we read is from God. So we ought to have this heart that says, Lord, thank you. Even our IQ, our brain cells, our attitudes that want Him, they're all from the Lord anyway. Look at verse 22. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in His kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. This is, for me, one of the most scary verses in the Bible. And all the verses with the same theme. This warning that says, stand firm, stand fast, watch out, examine yourself, test yourself to see if you're in the faith. All these verses serve as warnings to us to not be arrogant. How many of you have been Christians for more than three years? Can I see a raise of hand? Okay. I have a question. When you started off, do you remember the first year that you came to the Lord? The very first year. Yes. And you just kept Put down the Bible and you can't stop sharing your faith and everywhere you go you see potential converts you know you're thinking along the lines of do you know Jesus do you know Jesus do you know Jesus if you have spare time you pull out the Bible and that's all you do but then as the years go by Bible reading seems a little bit harder your prayer life begins to struggle you begin to feel bored you begin to feel like, you know, I've read the Bible more than five times. I already know the point of this text. I've theologized this several times ago. Then it gets a little repetitive. And then what happens? We start treating Christianity and our relationship with God like a fad. And so the tendency is people still go to church, still attend Bible studies, still go to discipleship and all that but these are all external deep down on their private personal times close to non-existent and i think there's a very real warning here you see there's a doctrine called the perseverance of the saints and that teaching or that doctrine tells us that once god saves a person it's also god who will ensure that this person will persevere. But this doctrine comes with it a warning that says, don't stop. It's not just God gonna, who will do things for you automatically and you don't have a role. That's not true. The fact is, as much as God is uh, pushing you and causing your heart to burn for Him, we also have our part. And our part is to keep reading, to keep seeking Him, following Him. Can you imagine if we treat Jesus like a fan. You know, like those mobile apps that we play, Clash of Clans, you know, or uh, a hobby. Can you imagine if one day we say, you know, I'm still saved because at one point in my life, at one point in my life, I was active in ministry. 
Right now, not anymore. Right now, I don't really read my Bible that much. You know, it's just so-so. But I'm still saved because at one point in my life, you know how that sounds to my ears? It sounds like this. I'm still saved because at one point of my life, I treated God the same way I treated Clash of Clans. Same level. I was very excited at one point, then I quit. With Jesus, so excited at one point, now I kind of quit also. But I'm still saved. You really think you are, if that's the attitude? I doubt it. And that's a real warning. Verse 23 says, Even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. Of course, this is talking about, Paul is talking about Israel. At one point, hopefully, the remnant of Israel will repent. And when they do, and it's a guarantee, they will be grafted in. Because they're the, quote-unquote, the original branches. Verse 24 says, For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? In other words, God's saying, in Israel, in terms of Israel and the Gentiles, Israel was the original. They were removed because of their unbelief to put the Gentiles in. But if they also repent, Obviously, they will surely be grafted in because they're the original branches. The DNA is the same. We are the unnatural branches. We Gentiles. Now, if you were to translate that to today, going back to the analogy of churches and how we've come from different churches and even New Covenant Church comes from a different church also entirely, we ought not have pride. We should in fact say, God, thank you for this. And instead of saying things that might lift us up to the detriment of others, we should start praying for others and say, Lord, with the same grace you've showered upon us, we pray the same thing for all other churches, all other Christians, all other congregations and denominations everywhere. Because we want the same thing for them. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, he says, lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. It's a partial hardening. Meaning, it's not going to be forever. It's not going to be permanent. There's going to be a day when all the remnant, all the elect from Israel will come. But right now, it's not happening yet because there's a set number of Gentiles, us, who will still repent. Perhaps some aren't even born yet, physically, in this world. Until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Now remember, that word fullness, that's completion. And so this fullness means there's a guaranteed number. There's a set number. You can't, nobody can add or subtract to this number of people who will one day come in. And that gives us so much confidence when we evangelize. We know that no matter how hard we try, we cannot force someone because it's not our role, it's God who will do it. It gives us security in our evangelism. But more than that, we should always have a heart for everyone else. Wherever we come from, whatever denomination, and etc. Verse 26. And in this way all Israel will be saved, as it is written, that the, deli the deliverer will come from Zion, he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now this does not obviously mean we should become Jewish converts. It doesn't mean we should start uh, practicing Messianic Judaism. Okay? That's not what it means. It also doesn't mean, obviously, that all Israel as a nation will be saved. Because even earlier, Paul already said, not all Israel is Israel. But what this means is, there is an elect group. There are remnants, or there's a remnant in Israel who will be saved. Today, Israel is an unbelieving nation. Sadly. 
they still go to the wall, the wailing wall, and that's where they pray. They reject Jesus as Messiah. They reject Jesus as Lord. And until now, they're still waiting for the coming Messiah. They think that the Messiah has not yet arrived. When in fact, Jesus already said, it's me. It's always been me. All the scriptures have been pointing to me. And yet you reject me. You deny me. But one day, one day, God's going to bring all the elect from Israel. Before that time comes, God is still bringing in all the Gentiles. And so we have to be grateful. We have to be humbled by this. Verse 28 says, As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. Forefathers meaning the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. So there's a sentimental value attached to this. There's a covenant that God has made with the forefathers. And he says, he's faithful. He's going to make sure all the promises will come to pass. Even the spiritual promises will come to pass in the future. So for, for our sake, it sounds like they're enemies. And many times, many times here's what happens. When God gives you favor, you start thinking that you're friends with God and everyone else is God's enemies and I'm the only friend. And I can pray against others because God, I, I got your favor. I'm the obedient one. I'm the lovable one. They're disobedient. So, you know, God, you can do whatever you want with them. But, tayo, we're good. That's pride. That's arrogance. You see, there's a very thin line between validation and vindictiveness. It's very easy to feel vindicated, and it's even easier to feel vindictive. It's so easy to cross the line from acceptance to arrogance. And that's something that everybody should always remember, and we should all repent of from time to time. Look at verse 29. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. How many of you have ever tried fixing a Rubik's Cube? Are you familiar with the Rubik's Cube? The, the cube with many colors with different sides, and you have to put all the colors in the same side. How many of you have ever accomplished it? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, just one. I've never accomplished it. And you know, I think that receives an award speech. But really, when I spoke to a friend of mine who's a master at it, without even looking, he can already like fix it. So I told him, is there a pattern to this? Is there a secret? You know, the easiest thing to do is to break the cube and then get the pieces and put them together. You know? <laughs> and just break the whole thing. And he says, no, 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 there's a pattern. And I told him, my biggest frustration with the cube is just when you have one side perfect, all the other sides are not. So you have to destroy one side to fix another side. And it just is a never-ending cycle. It's like the Twilight Zone. And so he told me, bro, here's the trick with the cube. Don't think about fixing one side first. It will never work. You have to break it as a whole. And whenever there's a side that's already fixed, you already know you're going the wrong way. And so he says, here's the trick. With a cube, you have to dislodge some correct pieces, some perfected sides, to get everything else in. And once you do, the whole cube will fit together. And in the same way, that's what God has done with human history. Between Gentiles and Israel, the Rubik's Cube is actually human history. God dislodged the Jews first to get the Gentiles in, and when the Gentiles are set, He's going to fix everything, and all the elect from the Jews and all the elect from the Gentiles will all be saved. And everything will have perfect signs everywhere. That's exactly what God's doing with us today. So, for us, we are that side that's being prepared. 
we shouldn't be arrogant and say, Ha! Ah, look at them! God's breaking them for me! Don't forget, God's also dislodging you for them. So there's mutual humility on all sides. Here's what normally happens. Verse 32. God has consigned all to disobedience that He may have mercy on all. Basically, here's what happens. God reminds us all the time that none of us are worthy. None of us deserve His grace. Grace, by definition, means undeserved. In fact, it means ill-deserved, meaning you deserve something bad, and yet God gave you something good. That's ill-deserved. And we ill-deserve grace. And we should all just be thankful. The problem is, it's human nature to compare. And when you compare, you start to compete. And when you start to compete, you'll always end up in one of three categories. One is pride. When you're doing better, you say, ha-ha, I'm better. Or, feel insecure. Oh, they're better. Or, you become apathetic. I don't care about them anymore. I don't want to work for myself anymore also because if I do, I become pride, uh, prideful or I just become insecure. So I'm just going to drop the ball and not do anything. When you start competing, when you start comparing and competing, what happens is you either become prideful, you become insecure, or you drop the ball and you just won't care. You become apathetic. What's the other option instead of comparing? Here it is. In verse 33, Paul says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been His counselor or who has given Him a gift that He might be repaid? The trick is to not start comparing yourself with others. The, the biblical thing to do is to look unto Him and just marvel at Him is to look at God and say, God, you're amazing. You're unsearchable. Your mind is so deep and so vast and so wide that nothing else can compare to you. And so if your mind is fixed on God, and of course on Christ, because Scripture does tell us, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. When you fix your eyes on Christ, you won't have time to compare. You won't have time to start thinking of yourself as better or worse than others. You won't have time to think of your achievements as more, uh, more impressive than the achievements of others. All you'll start thinking of is, Jesus, you've done everything for your glory and my benefit, and I'm so amazed, and I just want you to do the same for everyone else. Because what you did in my life is just so good. Everyone should experience this as much as I can possibly share. That becomes the attitude. And look at verse 36. Why do we focus on Him? Why do we fix our eyes on Him? Look at verse 36. He says, for, when you say for, that actually means because. Because from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. And to Him be the glory forever. Amen. What Paul is saying is, he gets the credit, not us. He gets all the applause. He gets the praise. It, and it ought to be. It should never be about us. That's what we call a Christ-centered or God-centered theology. It's when your doctrine, what's in here, points up, not down. So what normally happens when you're validated? Normally, we feel vindictive, we feel arrogant, we feel like we feel prideful. Now to end the story with the father and the beggar and the biological son, at the end of the day, he forgave, he disciplined, and he forgave the beggar. He disciplined and he forgave the biological son. And he got them both in. And that will be the end story between the Gentiles and Israel in the future. Today, that ought to be a continuing ending story. I know that sounds contradictory. But that ought to be our attitude. We ought to always think this way. God, 
for every sin that I do, especially against those I feel arrogant towards. I'm sorry. Please forgive me and please change me and help me repent. Help me change my attitude. And at the same time, Lord, for everyone who's not experiencing the same favor and grace that you have showered upon me, Lord, I pray that you would do the same for them. That ought to be the attitude. Let's get rid of what we call self-importance. Let's get rid of that. When someone's achieving, let's be happy for them. Let's start rejoicing with them instead of pulling them down or instead of saying, Lord, ako di ay, what about me? Or the opposite is, yeah, he may be achieving that in that area of his life, but look at the other areas of his life. <laughs> you know, let's, let's get rid of those. When God gives you a home, the effect ought to be humility. Our security, our confidence, our identity should be in Christ. And this is something that I think New Covenant Church, as a church, should be very, very uh, wary of. And we might have to even repent of this personally and even corporately. Because our identity, many times, the temptation is our identity is our distinctives in our theology. Oh, we're New Covenant theology. Oh, we're Calvinists. Oh, we're, we believe in this and that. And, you know, that ought not to be our identities. Our identities are first, we're Christians. I'm not saying those identities are bad. I'm not saying those labels, those distinctives are wrong. They're not wrong. They're helpful. But most of the time, the, the good things become God things. It's easier to make an idol out of a good thing for Christians. Because it's so good. We think it's so good. This, become, this is where you will revolve your, your whole identity on. That ought not be the case. And let's not forget that. Instead, let's marvel at God's majesty. Let's always look at what God has done in your life, in the lives of others, and let's be thankful. And for the lives of others, for other places, groups, denominations, etc., that we see are going through issues, going through problems, especially, again, I want to remind you because we come from different churches, if you're thinking of the churches you, you come from, let your attitudes be a heart that says, Lord, the same grace you showered upon me, shower upon them. Lord, if possible, give me opportunities so I can help, I can serve, I can show love, I can give whatever service I can. Help me have that heart. That ought to be the case. Again, in terms of all human history, it's one big Rubik's cube, and God is not yet done twisting this cube. You know what we should do? Watch Him work. So as a final note, picture a cube, but instead of just nine cubes per side, imagine a billion, a billion side, a billion cubes per side with a billion sides. Can you picture it? A billion sides and a billion little tiny cubes per side. You're just one of those little cubes. God's still twisting that. So how can we have the arrogance to say, huh, I know exactly why God put me here. When you think of yourself as that tiny cube, that's very arrogant to say. But rather, as a cube, we should just keep staring at God and saying, wow, look at what, what God's doing in my life. He's transferring me here, putting me here, putting me there. Wow, that's amazing. Look at what, what God's doing with everybody. That's amazing. He's putting everyone in their right places. God's fixing the cube. He's still twisting the cube. And all we should do is say, Lord, I can't wait till all of this is done. In the meantime, you're amazing. You're awesome. And I want your awesomeness to be displayed, not just in my life, but in everybody else. Does that make sense? All right. Let's pray.